Good evening, indie community, and welcome to Splam. That is self-publishing like a motherfucker. The not-at-all-safe-for-work podcast in which we interview fellow self-published authors and pick their brains for the secrets to their success. With me this evening is my co-host, Claire Taylor. Say hello, Claire. Hello. And joining us from Authors and Dragons is just uh, one co-co-host tonight. Um, That is... Uh, John Hartness. Say hi, John. Hi, John. And um, last time I started out asking if any of us hosts and co-hosts and co-ho-hosts had any um, anything to talk about going on in their, in their lives or their work. And it was kind of a disappointment, but I'll give it another run. Um, I'll start. I'm here, too. I was going to introduce you after we had our little host bit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking enthusiastic, bro. Yeah, that's good. Okay, um, I'll start. <laughs> oh, shit, now I forgot my news. Oh, yeah, nothing big. I reached the 50,000 word mark in our uh, in Critical Failures 8. Yay! I find that exciting because I want to read Critical Failures 8, so... I hope you want to read 7, too. I'm uh, almost done editing that. I can't remember how many of them I've read, so <laughs> I guess 6 would be the answer. John, you got any news? Uh, I'm working on the print edition of Quincy Harker Year 4. I'm working on getting the covers for the hardcover and paperback wrap of that. I hope to have that ready to go this weekend. And then I'm about a third of the way through Quincy Harker 5. So that's where I am. Claire? Uh, yeah, I, my my biggest win this week was that I did a little indie author mastermind with some other folks, um, and it was like four days of socializing, and so I worked entirely out of my bed la- yesterday to recuperate from all the extroversion, and uh, so now I'm back at it, and I'm feeling a lot smarter for it. All right. Great. Well, I guess that brings us to this week's guest. Today we have Gail Martin. Gail, you can go ahead and introduce yourself now. You can say hello now, Gail. Yeah. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Gail C. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, and comedic horror. And as Morgan Bryce, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. Hello, everybody. Hi. Great to have you. Great to be here. Jeez. Thanks for having me. I'm not saying hello. I'm fucking having dinner with you tomorrow night. So <laughs> oh, this will be our second guest that makes me feel inadequate. Well, the dream if is we, that all of them will. <laughs> I was just going to say, if we do the invitations right, we should always feel inadequate. Or maybe that's why I take all these fucking pills on my desk because I have the crippling anxiety. So one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, th- I thought crippling anxiety was just sort of the bar to get in the club. I think crippling anxiety, is, that's going to be the name of my next band, <laughs> which would also be my first band. <laughs> I don't even know how I would get anything done if I didn't have crippling anxiety with a whip at my back. Yeah, I mean, really, it, it, you get so used to working around these things that I, I don't know what I'd do if they were gone. <laughs> be happy, maybe? <laughs> You know, happy and broke. Yeah. You do with you do what you can with what you've got on the day that you've got it, um, which is sort of my motto for life. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. Oh, speaking of life, let's go back to the beginning. What is that noise? That is a clock in the room that oh, I. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> You'd be quieter. Um, Gail, how did you? Uh, how did your writing career begin? Um. Well, I knew I wanted to write stories from the time I was a kid. Um, I wrote my first story when I was five, but I had to dictate it to my grandmother because I couldn't spell yet. And it was about a vampire because my favorite TV show when I was a preschooler was Dark Shadows. Don't ask me what my mother was thinking, but that was my favorite TV show. Other kids would get like a big empty box and make a race car out of it or an airplane. I made a coffin and rose from it. (laughs) True story. (laughs) <laughs> this explains um, so, <laughs> so much about you. It does, doesn't it? So nobody should really be surprised that I write the stuff I write. And when I was 14, it finally occurred to me that people aren't like born. Hello, I'm a suddenly I'm a published writer coming out of you know the hospital as a baby. And I thought, you know, someday the people who are writing books now are all going to be dead. And if other people don't write, start writing books, then there won't be any books. 
And I thought, wow, just regular people can write books. I want to write books. And that kind of set everything else in motion. I was 14. So, you know, it took a lot longer to get published, but that's another story. Well, all right. Your main drive, your initial drive was that you were afraid the world was going to run out of books. <laughs> yeah, because if all, the, if all the people who were writing when I was a kid, you know, they were going to get old and die. And then where, where would the books come from? So I seriously picked my college major in medieval history so I could write epic fantasy. And then I took my MBA in marketing for my side gig because I didn't want to wait tables. And <laughs> that's how I perceived my corporate work was this is my side gig while I'm really trying to get my writing going. And, um, and oh, yeah, I can use the marketing to sell the books that I'm going to write someday. And... That's honestly, I told everybody when I went for my MBA, I'm just doing this so I can afford typing paper. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I finally went back after the books came out, the first several books came out, and I did a signing at the Penn State Hub. And some of my grad school friends came back and said, you said you were going to do this. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was kind of a neat moment. Um, so, yeah, it just took... I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was 14 and I didn't get published until I was 45. So, you know, it only took how many years to become an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> and Gail, you're a little different than a lot of the people we're going to have on this show, because since it is titled self-publishing like a motherfucker, you didn't start off self-publishing. No, I went the traditional route originally because back in the early 2000s, it, it wasn't as easy to do anything else but. Not that going the traditional route was necessarily speed bump free, but I did the whole get an agent, get a publisher. Um, I was with a big uh, London publisher, and then I was with a big New York publisher, and I've done anthologies for a gazillion small presses, and um, we do three series and a gazillion books for fall staff, uh, which I'm really thrilled about. And um, then... Various and sundry things happened, and we decided, you know what? We're kind of tired of the big publishing gig. I think we can do better on our own. And so now we have contracts with Falstaff. We have contracts with Recorded Books and Tantor. And everything else at the moment is coming out indie. And it's been going well so far, knock on wood. What What is this Falstaff you speak of? <laughs> Oh, you know, some schmuck in Charlotte decided to open a press and all he does is publish his friends. <laughs> but when you look at the people who were my friends, you'd publish those motherfuckers too. So. so what made you decide it was time to transition from traditional to indie? A um, couple of things. One is I had a couple of situations in a row where a publisher asked for a book. We went through months of hammering out a very detailed outline and world overview and series overview and character overview. It was all blessed up and down the food chain and signed off on. And when I turned it in, they said, well, we know this is what we contracted you for, but we'd really like a completely different kind of book. So it was sort of like selling a book on Sparkly Unicorns and turning it in after it's all been approved and having them say, this is nice, but we really now decide we want a book on Navy submarines. <laughs> and I said, no, the whole idea of a, of a contract is I turn in what I'm contracted to turn in <laughs> that you agreed to publish and pay me. And you, you don't get to have me just write an infinite number of books for that money until you suddenly have changed because you know you could change your mind again and again and again and i said no um not worth it and we walked and um it, it just i i felt that that was very disrespectful um i felt that that also kind of showed you didn't really understand what a contract was for, because if I turned in a book about Navy submarines when I'd been contracted to write a book about sparkly unicorns, well, that would have been bad on me. Um, mm -hmm. Contracts tend to legally go both ways. And I felt like that wasn't being respected. And um, my time was more valuable than wasting it like that. And we walked and my agent was in agreement 
And uh, then we said, okay, now what are we doing? And I said, well, I'm going to write faster and I'm going to write in more subgenres and I'm just going to do what I damn well please. And that's been working out pretty well so far. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Claire, can you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? All right. Did you ask that last question? Yes, I did. Because I didn't hear it. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, just the, I, it was not, not like I wasn't paying attention. No, it's just no sound came through. This. All right, but yeah, I heard an odd hello from you for a second there. Yeah, that was me. Now, now I feel like a dick for saying it because she was probably saying something in the middle of that. Did you get uh, we, trapped in a well too? I guess for like the first four episodes of Authors and Dragons, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's true. Yeah, no, the idea of Bob being trapped in a well, well, that's just status quo. All right, well, sorry for interrupting your question, Claire. Um, so, Gail, what year was that exactly? I'm just curious where in sort of the indie publishing, you know, uh, rise, uh, your hurried departure from traditional publishing. That was last year and oh. 14 books ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Gail writes fast. Um, well, I think it's interesting because we had Barry uh, Barry Hutchison on last week, and he had a very similar story of why he left traditional publishing, and he, his departure was pretty recent too. Like I was, I was surprised uh, that traditional publishing is still pulling that shit at this point when they know that there's such competition with independent publishing. I don't uh, yeah. think they see this competition. I think they think that we are all pretty much interchangeable widgets. And um, I, I really don't think they perceive that there is any viable path except theirs. And I also think that at least what I experienced, um, and, and it was kind of the final thing with editor turnover, because with uh, one of the large New York publishers I was with, and this is one of the top five publishing firms, I was with them for six books and six years, and I had three editors. And for two and a half of those six years, I didn't have an editor because they were looking for a new editor. So how and how do you have continuity with an editor who, when they have a revolving door like that, and the editors kept getting younger and younger and younger? Not that they aren't bright and smart and well-educated and bushy-tailed, but they don't have the industry connections. They don't have the industry experience. They can't say, well, when I edited this other person's super best-selling book, we changed this and, you know, it made all the difference and maybe you should think about that. It's, you know, instead I ended up um, talking the the uh, young, excited new editor out of why I couldn't not kill a character whose death I had foreshadowed for three books in the fourth <laughs> book of the series just because she liked him. Uh, no, I, I really can't do that. <laughs> We've mm -hmm. already bought the tombstone. Um, <laughs> and that was very frustrating because while she was a lovely person and very enthusiastic, the experience level just wasn't there. Um, and I, I think some of that is what you see with these messianic editors who go, this is nice. You sent me this manuscript. Now I can play with it and make it my own. Yeah. That's not really what they're there for, but don't tell them. Right. Yeah, that's not an editor's job. Now, what were the pieces of working within the traditional publishing framework that you really enjoyed? Uh, you know, when it worked well, and they did a co-op deal with Barnes & Noble or Waterstones or back in the day Borders. And I could walk into one of their stores in a big mall and have an end cap with my stuff on it. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Or when they'd pay the extra to have me in new releases or new in sci-fi. That was great because, of course, none of that just happens by accident. There's, there's always cash crossing hands. There were some review sites and bloggers that were more receptive to them making the contact than, you know, me making the contact or it wasn't possible for me to make the contact. That was pretty cool. Um, and getting set up to do a signing in Forbidden Planet in London was pretty cool. Um, you know, I learned the ropes in their fold, but the ropes aren't as different out here as they kind of like you to think they are. 
once you know how the business works. You, you said you were in the trad pub business for uh, 14 books. Is that correct? Yeah, it was probably more than that. It was from 2007 until 2017. Okay, well, that gives me a, a time frame then. I was wondering if you noticed the, uh, the industry change at all from your perspective. Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing was that whole exodus of experienced publishers, many of whom were legendary in the field and who were too young to retire <coughs> and got pushed out with the mergers or the reorganizations um, and this influx of enthusiastic but inexperienced editors. That was that was a huge thing that happened in that 10 years. There were a lot of there was a lot of consolidation. And I think also um, the kind of marketing support that I got at the beginning and the kind of marketing support that they were offering authors at the end of that 10 years markedly changed. Um, and I, I think part of it was they just, you know, had cut so many people that they were pretty much down to, hey, we'll run a Facebook ad for you and look at all these tweets we're willing to. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is what I was actually curious about specifically. Yeah, some of the other stuff uh, just, well, you know, you can't do a co-op deal with Borders if Borders isn't around anymore. Right. The whole piece of, you know, isn't it wonderful to be trad published because we can get you, you know, you'll be in bookstores. Well, two things. There have to be bookstores. That's a big piece of that. And the other is that with the consolidation and the bankruptcies and the, you know, death of a lot of bookstores and the financial pressures on them, you may be in a bookstore, but they may only have books one, three, and five. Usually they don't have book one. They have books three, five, and nine. I've experienced that trying to buy books for my kids. Or they have such a limited number of shelf facings that they only go with like, you know, the New York Times 30 or the New York Times 50. So, yes, you could be in bookstores, but that doesn't guarantee that you will be in bookstores. Well, that's one of the arguments I hear uh, for, for trad publishing is uh, the reason I ask is because I hear a lot that, uh, well, I, I want to get traditionally published because, you know, they'll handle all the marketing for me. I don't want to be a marketer. <laughs> oh, yeah. You remember that MBA I got in marketing? <laughs> I use it all the time. Um, and you mentioned an interesting thing that uh, is sort of a mindset shift that I think a lot of indies are going to have to get on board with, which is um, that you don't create a big buzz just from Facebook and Amazon ads. Like what you were talking about, you get mentioned in blogs and you get good placement and these things that people have to have connections to do. And I think there's sort of this, and maybe you've experienced it, maybe you know how to work around it because of your background. But um, this idea that, well, if I just run enough Amazon ads, if I just run enough Facebook ads, I will be discovered rather than making yourself, you know, inserting yourself into these little niches, these blogs, you know, and, <laughs> and, and getting um, like making yourself discoverable. Well, I, I'm a big believer in blog tours. I've done two blog tours that I set up myself um, for the last 12 years, one in the summer and one right around Halloween. But um, with the new, with the large number of new books coming out and in a, a broader variety of subgenres, I've now tapped into getting some, um, some marketing groups that specialize in blog tours to help me. And right now I've got an audiobook tour running for one of our audio releases. That's the third tour of three that were scheduled. I've got three upcoming tours for new release books, print and ebook. Uh, I've got a Facebook party for one of the romance books. I've got another blog tour that had a cover reveal and a release blitz, and now a month long blog tour that's specially focused on the male male romance genre, and a Facebook party for that. And I'm in a uh, I'm in a night owl review um, giveaway that's especially for romance authors. And last month I was in a prolific works giveaway that broke prolific works. With it. <laughs> we had fifty four thousand downloads in the first evening, and at the end of a seven day run, we had one hundred and ten thousand downloads. Prolific works actually 
um, kind of creaked to a halt that first night and sent out an email saying, um, guys, we're really sorry, but, but due to popular demand. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I'm doing underneath the surface while writing as you know, trying trying to keep up with this release schedule that we've come out with. John, you were talking about all being ducks paddling like hell under the surface. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the paddling like hell for me <laughs> is running these other marketing campaigns with some on and off Facebook and Twitter support. I have not tiptoed into Amazon ads yet. That's on my list of things to do, nor have I tiptoed into BookBub again on my list of things to do. But I'm seeing some I, I'm seeing. I think some very nice results from the blog tours and the things that I am doing and working with smart review services. And that's, um, that's had some good, good results. It's, it's all about getting out to a broader audience than the people who are in your immediate couple of circles of normal influence. And I love that you're creating your own buzz. Well, I'm doing my darndest to, to make that happen. Um, and I, I, I see people who I can see the numbers with the followers on the the reader sites or the followers that have just blipped up on Pinterest or the new subscriptions to the newsletter. Um, that's very measurable. And then, you know, I can see it in the Amazon sales rank. I can see it when we finally get the numbers back. It makes a difference. And, you know, there's a quote from the famous uh, department store guy, John Wanamaker, who said, I know 50% of my marketing is wasted. I just don't know which 50%. Mm. And there's still a lot of truth to that. Um, but I think that if it's targeted and you're hitting an audience that's receptive to your to the product that you're selling or the genre in this case, that that exposure pays off. One of the things I like about some of the stuff that you're saying, Gail, is that it's not what we hear from every indie success story because you're not chasing every book bub and you're not pouring thousands of dollars into Amazon advertising. You are working different things. And I think that's important for people to realize that you don't have to follow every, you don't have to follow someone else's blueprint. You enjoy doing blog tours. So you do a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't dig them. So I don't do them. You know, it's, it's not a requirement for success to do any one thing. No. And different people find a sweet spot with different things. I, I have poured thousands of dollars into Facebook and Twitter ads over the years. Um, and I've seen moderate payback. But I know other people who have seen much larger payback and, and a much more direct link. Um, that's great. I'm still experimenting. I hope someday I find the, the magic recipe to make that happen too. But um, I definitely do see... I think the the payback on the blog tours and uh, some of these other promotions, which are less expensive per promotion, and as long as you're hitting bloggers that are actually reaching your audience, um, you're getting out there to people that you aren't otherwise encountering. And that's the biggest thing, because I do a lot of conventions. But at each convention, there's a fair number of people that I saw at last year's convention, pros and, and, you know, guests. So it's also a matter of showing up in new places where there's a likelihood of your audience being already there and saying, hi, guys, have you seen me? I'm over here. Um, and not just being in the same places over and over again and hoping that this time somebody will buy three copies of your book instead of one. Right. I love what you said about you're doing the book, you know, blog tours because you enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that it's so easy to get caught up. Like John was saying, and like, you know, the, you have to do this and you have to do that. And I was just talking with someone the other day and she was like, I hate Facebook. Like I just, how do I like manage a Facebook group? And I just hate it. And I was like, well, you don't. 
Like, why, why are you <laughs> <Yeah>. doing that? <laughs> and it was, it was, you know, you kind of see the lights go on behind her eyes like, oh, I guess I don't have to use Facebook. It's like, no, people have sold books before Facebook. So I think that's a really important point that you bring up that this is something that works for you and it's something you enjoy. I did the same thing with Twitter for a long time where I just had this uh, cycle of spam that I'd pump out every day. And then uh, when I moved to Mississippi, I, and I've always hated Twitter. I, I just, I don't enjoy it. And that's why I did this. I thought, oh, well, it's, at least it's doing something. And then when I moved to Mississippi and uh, I had satellite internet that sucked and uh, doing that cycle took, you know, three times the amount of time, so I just quit. And then when I moved into a different house and had proper internet, I, uh, well, I mean, well, no. You know, during that time that I quit, I didn't notice any change in book sales at all. So uh, when I moved to a house with proper internet, I uh, never picked that back up. But, uh, yeah. It's interesting. Say, no, I was just say, so I, I agree with, you know, what both of you are saying. You, uh, if you don't like it, it's probably not going to work. And, uh, and you're, you're just better off doing the things that you enjoy. I think you know, same with writing and uh, uh, genres and whatever. That instead of following the market necessarily, it's uh, – yeah, I think people can tell when you, your heart is in something. I think so. I mean, I'm my main social media sites are Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Um, and I – absolutely enjoy i probably spend two hours a day on social media i enjoy the time on facebook and twitter because for me it's a way of connecting with other authors and with readers i can retweet other people's new release information and throw in some puppy pictures and a couple of you know cute otters and corgis and oh yeah hey i'm in this giveaway over on prolific works which i which is another thing that has been working really well for me aside from that monster giveaway that that broke the internet um that that's been a really good platform for me and so i can promote those things and i can promote other authors and on facebook it's in a terrific way to um make and deepen connection with other authors and with some of the more vocal and, and forthcoming readers. So um, that's been just a wonderful uh, opportunity. And, and, you know, like many of us, I work at home all day. Um, it's my husband and me and the dogs. And so this is also partially a little bit of social interaction. But those strengthened connections with other authors um, pay off tremendously when you actually get to meet in person or someone puts together a collaborative event like that big prolific works giveaway and now you're in the gang oh definitely facebook has has definitely been the number one tool for me to you know initially meet other authors and i think that's actually how bob and i met right yeah i believe so yeah because i can't think of anywhere else i've ever interacted with you <laughs> that's, that's by design <laughs> it, it's safer that way <laughs> yeah well and one of the other things that i just kind of happened into is and john's gonna laugh as soon as i say this i'm a huge supernatural fan oh no i have a question i <laughs> i i have prep for this okay oh okay well then so go keep ahead going. keep going oh i, I was gonna say I'm, I'm a huge supernatural fan i came late to the party um but i really went down the rabbit hole and i'm having a wonderful time because i haven't fangirled over something like this in a long long time <laughs> far too long so i'm enjoying it sincerely and, and utterly and I, I went to a um, supernatural convention here in Charlotte last summer. I didn't want to go and not know anybody. So I put a Facebook group together and said, hey, who, who else coming to the convention? Let's get to know each other here. And I'll throw a couple of room parties and I'll have a sign so everybody can find me and we'll all eat lunch together. And I'll give out Mardi Gras beads so we can all recognize each other. And I bought some supernatural swag. So if you come find me, I can give you stickers. Well, that group... The, the convention was last August. Everybody said, we're having too much fun to quit. Let's keep the group going. <laughs> so that group is now over 400 people strong. And so we do, every week we do a um, heat of the moment retrospective. That was a big episode um, that looks back on a couple of classic episodes. And we talk about those. Once a month, I have a guest author who uh, I've, I've had people through who actually have written the Supernatural tie-in books 
and Family Don't End with Blood and who run the big websites. But then I said, hey, let's have authors in who write um, urban fantasy and paranormal, the kinds of worlds that Sam and Dean could walk into and feel right at home. John's been a guest on that podcast. Faith Hunter's going to be a guest this month. Um, you know, we've had a bunch of of best selling, wonderful authors, and everybody says, you know, what I hear back channel is that was fun, and I sold a lot of books. Um, <laughs> but the point is that the the people who like the kind of story that Supernatural tells, a are going to like my urban fantasy because. That's the kind of story I tell. They're also going to like my Morgan Bryce stuff because that's the kind of story I tell. And I know all these other authors who write that kind of story. So let's introduce everybody and we're all going to have a good time. I didn't set that group up with any intention really of it being marketing. Right. It is still, you know, mostly passion and love, but there has become, you know, an opportunity there for people to get to know the other side of me as a writer and for me to introduce them to all my writer friends. And because we formed this bond through the shared love of this show, it feels natural and it doesn't feel salesy. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, if you like that episode, you'd probably like this book. And that's what friends do for friends. I love that. That is, that is super awesome. That proves a really, a really good point that some people don't believe about, you know, being the, the kind of fan and meeting your people. Um, and also, I am a fellow Supernatural fanatic. Yes, we're everywhere. All right, Gail, tell everybody who you ship. <laughs> I do ship Sam and Dean, or you can call it J2, whatever floats your boat. Uh -huh. uh, uh, there's there's a long explanation of why that is, but seriously, after season eight, nobody else would be able to understand or put up with them. So really, it's either <laughs> I, I was joking with someone that the show started out as two hot guys in a car driving around the country hunting ghosts. And now it's two unmarried guys pushing 40 living in a basement with their mom. <laughs> <laughs> and if you follow the recent arcs. <laughs> there is a lot of truth to that. There, there's still two hot guys, though. Um, mm -hmm. But the other piece that came out of this was, so I fell in love with Supernatural halfway through season 11, um, started binge, wa started to watch it on Netflix, said, where have you been all my life? <laughs> binge watched 11 seasons between April and the end of September so I could be ready for the start of season 12. I now live tweet every episode that's new. I've been an invited guest on Winchester Family Business blog, which is the biggest fan blog. Uh -huh. And I so it went on hiatus and I said, I can't do it without my show because I'd already read the tie-in novels. So I started reading the fan fiction, which I hadn't read fan fiction in years. I read several hundred of these and I took a turn down a dark alley and started reading The Slash and said, this is really good. Read several hundred of those, popped up for air and said, I wonder what the published stuff is like that isn't tied into a fandom read several hundred of those and said okay i want in on the fun this is just entirely too much fun so i now write urban fantasy male male paranormal romance as morgan bryce and um i i've got uh, six books out so far and we're looking at bringing out at least eight this year and it has become a major piece of what i do in addition to still writing the epic and the urban and the steampunk on the other side uh, as Gail or Gail and Larry books. So we're not going to say that Morgan Bryce is supernatural slash fic with the VIN numbers filed off, but... I go back to the idea that it's worlds that Sam and Dean could walk into and feel perfectly at home. The characters aren't Sam and Dean, but they get along well. And they're all real pretty. I, I've seen those covers. Yeah, yeah, that goes with, the, that goes with the, the genre. So really, you know, no, if you if you look at the backstories, if you look at the character development, it it's not not quite that. But certainly if you like Supernatural, you're probably going to, and you ship anybody, you're probably going to like um, what I write. And because I can't keep all these different worlds straight and have unique ones for everything – the epic fantasy worlds stand alone, but all of the urban fantasy worlds cross over, whether they're Gale books or Morgan books. 
So the characters from my Deadly Curiosity series and my Spell, Salt, and Steel series and the Sons of Darkness series that are written under the Gale name or as Gale and Larry Martin uh, show up in the Morgan Bryce books and vice versa. In fact, the main characters from the Night Vigil showed up in a Morgan Bryce book before their own book came out. And what I found is a fairly decent percentage of my Gale fans said, oh, cool, you're writing that stuff? And they went over and and got on that, that <laughs> bus. And a fair number of people who met me as Morgan went, oh, you write other stuff. And they went over and got on that bus. So it's just been a wonderful cross-marketing thing because there's, there's absolutely no secret about Gale and Morgan being the same. Um, and I, I never really anticipated that, but it's pretty cool. What is your Twitter handle if anyone wants to follow you? Sure. My, um, it's Gail Z. Martin. And then the other one is Morgan Bryce Book. And don't be surprised to see a lot of Supernatural pictures. And which one do you live tweet Supernatural from? I live tweet under the Gail Z. Martin. Oh, okay. Asking for a friend. <laughs> um, I have a question about... Uh, your pin names are those the only your only two names or those are the only two names um because it gets really crazy having to have websites and social media sites and everything else for multiple sure. the reason for the pen name for the male male romance is there isn't any explicit sex in the Gale Z. martin books but there is explicit sex in the morgan bryce books and i didn't want someone to pick up a book and have a heart attack getting something they didn't expect um, that is, it, it's really a branding thing. Do you have any fans that, uh, do you, or do you know of any fans that you've lost because you crossed over into MM uh, fiction? Well, you know, I have a number of gay and lesbian and queer characters in my other series that are not the main characters and their relationship isn't the main, you know, emphasis of the book, but there are prominent secondary characters. Um, and I, I did have one person who, who was a longtime reviewer, John, this was actually on a spell, salt and steel novella, yeah. um, who gave us a, still gave us like a four or five star review, but took exception to what he called pushing a progressive agenda with oh, this lesbian couple. Um, and when it really boiled down to was they existed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, nobody, he went to dinner at their house. It really wasn't even about their relationship, except there was this, you know, funny thing about in her large Italian Catholic family who pretended that they, that she and her wife were just friends, who was pretending to be totally oblivious, you know, who was totally on board with it. It was kind of played for a joke because who hasn't had a Thanksgiving meal like that? Mm -hmm. Um so that you know, it's only been one or two, and I w actually that that same reviewer popped up with a review on one of my other books. So I guess I didn't lose them completely after all. Um, not and and act and the number of folks who said, "Hey, I'm going to go read the Morgan stuff." Um, percentage wise, I was a bigger bump than I expected. So I'm I'm very very happy. Nice. Yeah, that's kind of the fear of people when they switch genres and one is a little bit steamier than the other. Um, but so I'm always interested to see if if fears are ever valid or if more people than will admit are perfectly happy with a, a nice sex scene. You know, I'm, I'm sure that it happens, but that was also one of the things that made me grind my teeth with traditional publishing because it was like, oh, you know, maybe you shouldn't write that because your fans will be confused. No, I think my fans are pretty smart people. <laughs> and I think they know what they like. And I have had people say, I love your epic fantasy. I really can't get into steampunk. Or your steampunk book was great. I really don't read urban fantasy. And I have other people who pretty much read all of it. That's okay. I think they can figure it out for themselves. And maybe because they like something I wrote, they'll try something they wouldn't otherwise try. And discover that they really do like it. But I think readers are way smarter than traditional publishing thinks they are. Now, I will warn people sometimes that my Gale stuff can have more graphic violence than the Morgan stuff. Uh, you know, the epic fantasy, where we're eviscerating and lopping off heads and defenestrating and all those other good things. Um, 
And that hasn't slowed anybody down either because, you know, we're Americans and we're fine with graphic violence. It's just the sex that bothers us. Yeah, yeah no nipples with your violence. <laughs> no female appearing nipples. Right, right. Plenty of man titty. Man fine. titty is fine. <sighs> You, yeah, I, I saw something where somebody had, you can cut these out and paste them over your, these are, are man nips. You can paste <laughs> them over your female appearing nipples and now it's legit. Or just do some stage makeup so they're extra hairy, right? Does, does that work? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm letting that one go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like one of those times when you've got so many really inappropriate comments that I just can't pick. I'm like, shit, I'm paper locked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to tease you. <laughs> well, that that's like when I was talking to an Australian friend and I kept talking about uh we were talking about food and I said something about meat pasties and he said, No, no, no. You know, a pasty is what a stripper wears. The <laughs> pie is a pasty. Good to know. Yeah. I think Lady Gaga wore a dress made out of meat pasties once, but <laughs> <laughs> and it's memorable, but yeah, you know, you be you. Right. <laughs> 2019 baby you do you do you what are the things that you really like better about being indie we can publish uh on our own schedule as quickly as we can put a good book together so you know pulling the cover together and the beta reads and the editing and all that we're not beholden to somebody else's arbitrary schedule um we can experiment uh, with new subgenres, we can collaborate. Um, those are just some of the things that are golden to me. And now I was always very fortunate with my covers, the majority of which I thought were fantastic that I got from uh, Trad Publishing. But, you know, I'm equally thrilled with the covers that I have now. And so I think it's very satisfying to feel that uh, there hasn't been any sacrifice in quality. And a lot of the people that we're working with, whether it's cover artists or editors uh, or publicity people, many of them used to work for big publishers. So they didn't get stupid just because they left. I'm working with the same caliber of talent that I was working with when I was trad pub. It's just we've all gone indie and now we work with each other out here outside the fence. And that's pretty cool. We well, say it used to, but isn't it true that uh, some still do? And that just because you're a, a cover artist with a, a traditional publisher doesn't mean, I mean, they don't own you. You're not locked in, are you? I, I mean, some of them are on staff and some okay. of them are, you know, contracted. But, um, you know, I've, I've worked with people on the outside who, whether they still contract with the big publishers or they used to, um, it's the same caliber of talent. Right. So that's really exciting that there, there doesn't have to be any decrease in quality. Uh, and honestly, I'm happy with the production quality of some of the stuff we've come out with indie over some of the bindings and some of the other things I saw on the other side. Yeah. That's what, that's one thing that gets me is there is that some review sites and some review publications have this real prejudice against print-on-demand titles. The print, some of the print-on-demand stuff I've gotten is way better paper and binding than some of the uh, mass-market offset press stuff that I've seen. Yeah, about the only thing there is, you know, y you can't do some of the flashy things like the partial varnishes yeah. and, and the metallics and some of that. I want spot gloss. I want spot <laughs> gloss so bad. Or the lenticular insert like a certain unnamed friend of ours just got. Don't even get me started on him. He's a fucking unicorn. I'd be able to tip my book from one side to the other and, and have things appear. But that aside, which really doesn't have much to do with the book itself, uh, you know, I've got the books on the bookshelf next to, in some cases, you know, we published one book with a traditional publisher and the next book in the series, Indie, and you put them next to each other and you can't tell the difference. You're, you're talking about the freedom of indie publishing, and that's uh, that's my favorite thing. That's what I get really excited about. Um, was there a, a, a one particular work you did where you you 
just went for it and said, wow, I really couldn't do this if I was still with Trad Pub. Well, I think the whole Morgan Bryce line, you know, I, I did that and I might have forgotten to mention it to my agent until Badlands hit number one for gay fantasy and hung there for a while. And <laughs> at which point I uh, heard from uh, Audible and I knew we were already doing some other deals with recorded books um, for the Gale stuff. And I called my, Ethan, uh, called my agent and said, um, so, Ethan, there's this other thing I've been doing, <laughs> and I've been <laughs> started writing urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance under a pen name, and I'm I'm currently hanging at number one in the category, and we're starting to get offers from translators and from you know uh, other co- companies outside of the U.S. to do translations and um, do audio books. Uh, this is the point at which I hand it over to you and you run with it. <laughs> and he's been very happy um, because it's worked out very well. But yeah, that, that was a bit of a surprise. That's one of those, you know, beg forgiveness instead of asking permission kind of things. Sure. But he's my agent. I, I get to make I get to drive. Right. That's what I see a lot of less experienced, traditionally published authors seem to forget. The agent works for you. Mm-hmm. You don't work for the agent. Now, another thing that you've done recently that I think is neat is, for the longest time, all your books came out branded as Gail Z. Martin. Mm-hmm. But you had this shadow collaborator mm-hmm. for a long time. Talk a little bit about bringing Larry out of the shadows and how you're deciding to brand some books as Larry books, some books as Gail and Larry books and all that. Sure. So um, Larry and I've been married for 31 years and he, um, I left corporate in 2003, finally got published in 2007. Um, He left corporate in 2010 and we'd all, we'd always said we'd love to work together, you know, writing books, but we didn't know when that would happen. Well, then, you know, there was this large merger and all of a sudden now was as good a time as any. Um, and so we've, we've, you know, spent the last eight years finding our way with this because at first, um, you know, he was always involved to the extent that when I was getting just about to send the books off, he'd, you know, help give it a last read close to the end there to just, extra eyes on the book, but he was working full time. He didn't have a whole lot of time, extra time. And he went from just reading it toward the end to reading it much earlier in the cycle to discovering that he's a terrific brainstormer and great at working out, you know, plot problems and coming up with characters and coming up with plot twists. So uh, whenever we have long car trips, which we tend to do because we have kids in college out of state, you know, if you've got a 12 hour one way car trip, you can plot at least three books in that, you know, each going up and coming down, uh, because what else are you going to do? And so he also does all the royalties behind the scenes, which is huge. He's an extremely good first editor. Uh, So by the time it goes out to our beta readers and our editor, he and I may have kicked it back and forth between you know ourselves a dozen or more times. With some of the short stories and novellas early on, he did he did the covers and I think did a great job with many of those. Um, so he and now he's doing more of the writing and coming into uh, well on this um, current book we're working on. I may do the first pass on. A first draft but then it goes over to him and if it's going to come out under his name then he he gets to work with that and do whatever he wants with it and, and change up the voice or you know change things around I've just given him something to start with and the cool thing is that after all these years our voice is very similar so that if he goes in and and fixes something he used to just sort of suggest a fix and now if it's something that isn't major, he'll just go in and make it. I often can't find where he did that if I don't attract changes on. So it's really become a very seamless collaboration. 
Um, and for what John said in terms of the branding, um, so the three series that we have with Fall Staff, um, the Spell Salt and Steel series, the upcoming Joe Mac Shadow Council series, and the Wasteland Marshall series, those are all Gale and Larry. The Iron and Blood Steampunk series and its spinoffs are Gale and Larry. Um, but we have a new Portal Fantasy book coming out that's going to be Larry and Martin. And we have uh, Salvage Rat, which is a space opera book. And that came out uh, as Larry and Martin. Uh, pretty much everything behind the scenes now is collaborative. But as John said, it's a branding thing. And there are some subgenres that, truth be told, are going to react better to having a male name on the book. And that's okay. At the end of the day, if people buy the book with the male name on it, we both get to spend the money. Oh, geez, Louise, I need like 25 of me to do all you do. <laughs> I didn't say I slept much. I really <laughs> got much else of a social life. Her kids are also a little older than yours. Oh, yeah. Couldn't have done this. Um, they're, they're all now in college or grad school or out on their own. I couldn't have done this. You know, when they were running around little, I was lucky to get one book a year done. I mean, your productivity increased just when your youngest went off to college. Sure, sure. Um, because what else am I going to do? I, you know, I'm too twitchy to knit. <laughs> yeah, that would look like a spider on crystal meth. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So how much do you write each day? You know, I try to get about four to six hours in of the writing. I'm not a morning person. So the morning is for email and administrative stuff and marketing stuff and social media and, and priming the pot with coffee. And then around one or two in the afternoon, I start writing the real stuff. And that goes until about 930 at night. And then I, you know, uh, close up and go read a little bit for fun or watch some TV, wash, rinse and repeat. So yeah, that whole afternoon from two-ish until nine-ish is the golden time. Um, that's my most productive time. What kind of, uh, I'm afraid to ask, what kind of word counts that usually? 10 entail? to 15 pages if everything's going well. And there are certainly days when it doesn't get there. Um, doesn't even get to the low end of that. But then there are some days when I do better. Um, and then there are some days when I've already lined up pr uh, promotion and I've got to get the friggin' book done. And I'm up, you know, one thirty in the morning trying to get my word count. And, and Faith Hunter and I are texting back and forth because we're both up at one thirty in the morning <laughs> trying to get our word count. Um, but, you know, in the end, it's all good. So, I mean, like I said, normally somewhere between 3,000 to 4,500 words on a good day. Do you That's set good. a word count goal or do you set a time goal? I shoot for, I predicate the, you know, I, I sat down and I came up with this idea of, well, what books do I want to bring out this year? Because they're the next in a series and people are waiting for them or I've already sold the audio rights. So I kind of need to write it. <laughs> um, or like with the Morgan Bryce, romance readers really don't want more than a couple of months, if that, between books, so I need to keep up the pace. And then I kind of back time that to, well, if I do 10 to 15 pages a day, how much can I produce month to month? And then what does that, if this book is going to be 250 pages and that book's going to be 300 pages, what does that roll out to be? And that's sort of how I came up with it. So it's a combination of I want to get this book done this month and I'm looking to do an average of 10 to 15 pages a day. Now, uh, I, from your earlier comments, I was led to understand you are a plotter. Is that correct? Yeah, I kind of have to be because especially doing this speed, I don't have time to go down dead ends. doesn't mean that I still don't find some, even though I think I've outlined it, because I can write a really pretty outline. I can sell a book on on spec with an outline and when i sit down to write from that outline i go this actually doesn't say anything i have no idea what's supposed to go in this chapter <laughs> um that happens but yeah i have to be because the better i outline the clearer it is in my head the more likely i am to get that 15 pages and and on a roll i might even nudge a couple extra out if if it's dialogue heavy so do you have any uh, new exciting projects that you're really looking forward to in the next few months? 
Several. There's this Portal Fantasy series that uh, we'll be saying more about publicly soon, but that's just going to be a rip rollicking adventure that um, you know our D and D roots are showing. It it's going to be if you if you liked Guardians of the Flame or those kinds of books, that's what this is. It's it's going back to what we both loved to read when we were, you know, um, maybe in high school. Um, not written for a YA audience, but but going back to those roots. Um, so I'm very excited about that. So fans of Critical Failures would probably like that, only there'll probably be less poop jokes. Yeah, I'm, I'm already thinking. I'm going to target these books in my ads. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, plenty of F-bombs, but probably fewer poop jokes. You never know, though. Oh, no. Um, um, I'd bet money on fewer poop jokes. <laughs> Bevan sets a high bar. <laughs> oh, it's a very low bar. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple of new Morgan Bryce series that are coming up, um, including one that is going to be set in Cape May, New Jersey, and that series title is Treasure Trail. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Um, which is the name of the Antique and Curio website and blog that the main character runs. Um, right. Right. Um, and then we have sequels coming up in all of our major series. And um, so I'm, I'm just excited about all of it. And John's got the first of the Joe Mack Shadow Council series. Um, so that's been turned into Falstaff. We're cleaning up the first in the Wasteland Marshall series, which is post-apocalyptic. And Tell them what Joe Mack is. So the Shadow Council is a spinoff of John's Quincy, Hunter Demon, uh, Quincy Harker Demon Hunter series. And kind of like if League of Extraordinary Gentlemen didn't suck. Yeah. <laughs> and so Quincy's got his territory, but there are these other uh, people working for the Shadow Council in different time periods and different geographic locations. And so and, and many of them, like in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, are more than they appear to be. So in our Joe Mack series. It's the the character is actually Joe Majorac, who is the legendary uh, steel worker in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's got a statue in Pittsburgh. He's the patron saint of, of of Pittsburgh steel workers, and he's become immortal. And he is a champion against the forces of darkness. And it's set in the 1920s. In um, it'll move from place to place, but the first one is in Cleveland. And so you've got. Um, mafia witches and um, Russian vampires and speakeasies and um, you know uh, it, it's just a lot of fun and, and lots of things blow up. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, no wonder you're excited about writing that. Oh, it's a it's a blast. Uh, just going back into all the Roaring Twenty stuff for it is is so much fun. And for people who like more dick jokes, there's season two of Spell, Salt, and Steel coming, too. There is. I'm working on that right now. And um, that is a snarky monster hunter in the wilds of Pennsylvania. And it's, um, you know, the, the first line in the very first book is, when all else fails, the ass end of a carp makes a damn fine weapon. <laughs> and we proceed to see him beat a monster to death with a 30-pound carp. As one does. Um, <laughs> and we also encounter naked gnomes. And <laughs> beat the carp out of him. Beat the crap out of him <laughs> with a carp, yes. Stay at it five times fast. Um, and that, that one is just a joy to write because it's so much fun to be that much of a smartass. Like, you know, and you run into side characters like Donnie, the defective werewolf. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's he needs spinoff stories. Yeah, he's he's kind of fun. Um, so we're just having fun over here and yes. making a living and making a very good living. Yeah, last last year turned out well. So now, of course, the trick is um, to do it again <laughs> <laughs> and see if it was a fluke. But you know. You have this, uh, and speaking here as somebody who's in corporate for 17 years, you have this 
delusion of security when you're working for a big company because they pay you every two weeks. But the truth is that, you know, they can call you in any time and say, guess what? See you later. So there really isn't any security and you don't have any control over having your company bought out from under you. And um, it just you just have this delusion. And out here, you don't have this delusion. But if something isn't working, I can change it. If something, you know, if I want to add something, go in a different direction, respond to the market, um, I can I can do something different. For example, my first three epic fantasy series are known as Chihuahua Killers. I mean, they are big, fat, epic fantasy bricks, 600 pages. And the minimum word count in the contract called for 175,000 words. I could go over that, but I couldn't go under it. That's 600-ish pages, maybe half a Sanderson. Um, but I keep having people tell me that they used to read epic fantasy, but they don't have time for it anymore. So the new Assassins of Landria series is buddy flick epic fantasy that is epic fantasy without the epic length. The first book came in at under 250 pages. It is, it doesn't have as many braided plot threads or points of view. Uh, It is very much a buddy flick, but it has all those epic fantasy feels to it, except it won't take you a month to read. I can do that because we can pivot and publishing doesn't pivot. Amen. <laughs> I love Anybody it. got anything else? I was just about to say, we've been going for a little over an hour. Yeah. So where, where can people find you online, Gail? Okay. Well, I make it real easy. You can find me at gailzmartin.com for the regular stuff and morganbrice.com for the romance stuff. I'm on Twitter at Gail Z. Martin or at Morgan Bryce book. Um, You're welcome to join my Worlds of Morgan Bryce fan group for the romance. Shadow Alliance is my Facebook group for the regular stuff. And anybody who's a Supernatural fan is welcome at the Supernatural uh, TFWNC Team Free Will North Carolina site. Um, so I'd love to see anybody and everybody on all of them. Awesome. Oh, thank you for joining us, Gail. You're a rock star. <laughs> well, I'm working on it. At least I've got the sequence like a rock star. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. This has been a blast. Thanks, Gail, and I'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on Splam. If you enjoyed this, we hope you'll like and subscribe and all that shit. And join us next time in the next leg of our journey towards self-publishing like a motherfucker. Goodbye. Goodbye.